Hello and welcome back to the channel. Here is an updated tour of the audio room. Now I did a tour of this room a couple of years ago and it seemed pretty popular among those of you who are audiophiles and there have been some changes here and I thought I'd walk you through some of them. The biggest change, and you may have noticed this right away if you saw the other video, the speakers have changed. I still have the MagnaPan 1.6 QRs. They used to be on stands over here, but I've had a minor life change that requires me to move them out of the room. I have a dear friend who travels the country a lot and he has this wonderful Maine Coon cat and he's so friendly and so sociable he can't bear to leave this cat in a kennel so the cat winds up staying with me for three or four months out of the year. He's a very well behaved cat. It's like almost like having a goofy kid around the house. If you've ever known Maine Coon cats, those are the largest domesticated cats. They can grow to be three feet long and weigh up to 25 pounds. They can be the sizes of small dogs. He's really well behaved. He doesn't jump. He doesn't scratch the furniture. But the MagnaPans do kind of look like giant scratching posts. So just to be safe, those are in the basement for now. As a result, I wound up using the Epos ES11s. Those are the original British design, not the Jew Chinese ones, and I've been listening to those. During this time, I've had friends tell me that I really should upgrade to the Kef LS50s because those are the spiritual descendants of the ES11s that I've been listening to. They're small, minimalist British mini monitors. And I've known this for a long time. I have friends who have the uh, LS50s, and I, when I listen to them, I think, yeah, you know what, I should probably get a pair of those, but as you can tell, I'm a bit of a late adopter when it comes to this audio equipment. But, you know, I, I saw them again, and they came out with this version, uh, the normal one in 2012, and they came out with a new meta version somewhere around 2020. So when 2020 hit, the versions of these started to decline on the used market in price to the point where I found a pair that I just could not pass up for the price that they were asking. I got them here and they are indeed quite wonderful. So if you look at this, most of you who are in high-end audio know this speaker. It's one of the most conservative recommended speakers out there. If you're new to this, this might look a little bit strange. First of all, there's only one driver or apparently only one driver. This is a two-way ported design. The tweeter is built into the pole piece, so it is technically a coaxial driver. Now, I don't know about you, but I have always associated coax drivers with one thing, bad car audio. <laughs> so there's a bit of psychological resistance here, but they've been doing this kind of thing for quite a while, and I don't notice any integration problems between the tweeter and the woofer. Also, the driver is made of metal. That can cause problems as well doesn't seem to cause any issues over here. Very clean, tight sound. That is what I like. And I'm enjoying these very much. And I do have to admit, they are better than the Epos ES11s. So as far as amplification goes, I have two amplifiers and I switch between them. One of them is the KN A50T. It is a 35 watt tube based amplifier. And then the NAD 316 BEE, that is a budget king component that's well known among audiophiles. People ask me in the last video, which one do you prefer? Well, the answer is, I can't name one. <laughs> I like them both. There was a writer, Corey Greenberg, who used to write for Stereophile magazine, and he said, you have a choice, the strength of silicon versus the velvet of valves. And I think that's a pretty good summary of what you have here. So I switch back and forth between them. One unusual feature of the KN is that you can switch on the fly, on the remote, between ultralinear and triode mode. So you can geek out over that. But as card-carrying audiophiles, we all know we have to say that we prefer it in triode mode. Down here, I have a Cambridge Audio 540C CD player. I don't hear a lot of differences between CD players, so I just bought the one that was in my price range. Down on the bottom shelf here, we have a pair of Antique Sound Labs AV20 tube monoblocks. I hook them up every now and then just to use them. Side of the room here, we have a pair of Neumann KM184 microphones that's used to record this piano when I have pianists over. The piano is a Zeiler 114, an astonishingly good and rich, full-blooded piano, considering that it is a relatively small upright. Turning to the turntables, oh my. You know, I've said this before. I have a lifelong troubled relationship 
with turntables. I have trouble getting one that works all of the time. Until now, the, this red one here is the Project Debut 3, and it has worked flawlessly for me for quite some time. And of course, being the kind of guy that I am, well, let's just try upgrading it. You know, I recently did a talk for the Boston Audio Society about what I've learned about audio. And one of the things I've learned is, if something's working, don't upgrade. <laughs> a lot of times when I upgrade things, things get worse. And I said that at the time, and I meant it, and I went ahead and did it anyway. So I went looking for a better turntable, and I bought what I'm supposed to buy. This is a Lin Sondek LP12. Those of you who know such things will see that it does not have the correct tone arm. This is a Project 9cc carbon fiber tone arm, and it is quite beautiful, and I got a fantastic deal on it, so I'm not really complaining because I'm not out a lot of money, and it looks great just as a piece of furniture. When I got it, there was just something not right. The seller said that he had tested it before he packed it up and shipped it. I don't see how that is possible. The counterweight appears to be the incorrect counterweight such that even if you turn it all the way in, I had to add nine grams worth of blue tack just to make the tone arm balance horizontally. Now you say, okay, well, theoretically it's fine, but now you've increased the mass of the tone arm and it wasn't what it was designed to do and things have changed. Another thing, it picks up hum from the motor. I know this because if you just lower the stylus onto an LP without turning the turntable on, it's quiet. The second you turn it on, it picks up the hum from the turntable. As far as I can tell, there is very little that you can do about this. I've been in there, I've gone to online forums, I've tweaked things, and it's just, I, I don't know. It looks nice, it's going to sit here for a while, but I have a feeling it's going to wind up in storage at some point. If anybody here wants to come in and work on this and tell me what I'm doing wrong, come on by, I'll buy you lunch. So after the last video, people started asking me, what are you listening to right now? What do you like? Well, I can tell you what I'm doing at this present time. I am working my way through most of the Rossini operas, the major ones anyway. 72 Abato, terrific, goofy, silly fun. This is one of the best recordings that I know of in my entire collection. The remake, eh, not so good. Still listenable, but not my favorite. Il Signor Bruschino. I'm not my favorite one of the operas, but it's short, it's on one CD, and you get to hear Kathleen Battle and her prime. Chenarentola with Shai on Decca, this is quite good. You know, the, a lot of these DG Abato recordings have terrific essays by Philip Gossett and by Abato himself, and I forget which one of them wrote this, but one of them said, Rossini's music washes away all of the sadness in the world. And he's right. When you're listening to Rossini, it's hard to be in a bad mood. I am, however, running into some issues here with the age of these CDs. I was listening to this, and these booklets are bound just with a glue on the back, and the glue is quite weak, and I was listening to it, and the whole thing just exploded on me like confetti and fell to the ground. Yeah, these uh, after 40 years or so, these things are starting to fail. But even worse, this is the Abato Viaggio. Some of my CDs now have CD rot on them. This happens with some CDs. It's not a lot of them, but it just seems to happen to the whatever one I happen to be pulling down and want to listen to at that present time. Yeah, it's got some rot on it. You can actually hold this CD up to the light and you can see right through it. So I've got to get another copy of this before I can listen to it. I know, I know streaming. People were asking me, why aren't you streaming like everybody else in the 21st century? I do kind of, I haven't really embraced it entirely. And part of it is that I haven't really found a user interface that I like for managing and playing things. Most people seem to be using Rune, but since I'm not ready to go full into this, I'm not sure I'm ready to pay for Rune. One of the most common alternatives to Rune I've seen is Plex. Plex Amp, Plex Media Server. I tried that. I must be dumb. I don't understand how to use it. I've never been able to get it to work. The version I have only runs in a browser, which concerns me because all I do is stream music locally. 
a lot of these services seem to assume that you're going to be streaming something off the internet, and I don't do that. I have a local hard drive with about, I don't know, a terabyte's worth of music on it. I started to rip a lot of my CD collection several years ago, and I got only partially through it. I have a feeling I'm going to have probably three or four terabytes worth of ripped music when I'm done. So those services aren't optimized for this. So I did find this thing called FUBAR2000. It works. Apparently, hardly anybody uses it because I can't find any support for it, but it's quite light and it seems to function for now. How do I get the music from the computer into the system? Well, I use a D to A converter. I'm, what I have right now is an AudioQuest Dragonfly Black. That is the least expensive of their DACs by far. And it looks like a USB stick, except it's much heavier. It plugs into the side here. It's got a 3.5 millimeter stereo mini jack. You run a cable to your system and off you go. So I'm slowly getting used to this. I do like the fact that you can get 10,000 albums on one little local thing without having to shuffle physical media. But you know, give me some time, I'll get there. So I thought I would show you some interesting things that I've gotten since the last update. All of these are quite heavy. I guess it's a sort of a thing with classical music that whatever you buy, the set has to be quite heavy. So this is Deutsche Grammophon, state of the art. I am a big DG fan. And this is a coffee table book, but get, they go through the history of the label and they go through all of these important recordings. It is a little bit self-congratulatory. It's a little bit, they're patting themselves on the back. I don't care. This is terrific. And it took me quite a while to get through this book because well, every time they would mention a recording, I'd be, oh yeah, I haven't heard that in a while. And I'd go and pull it down and listen to it. So it took me quite a while just to get through the book. Second thing I got, some of you know that I did an appreciation of the Schulte Ring and I listened to it on CD on a portable. Well, a viewer saw that and he gave this to me. It's the LP set, all 19 pounds of it. I'm having trouble holding this up, but I actually am going to go through and listen to this entire set. And if you look at this, you can see what happened. He listened to Rheingold. The other three haven't even been opened yet. So I'm gonna have some fresh LPs to listen to. But the biggest thing I got, the George Zell box from Sony. Whoever does this at Sony does a really great job because you get this classic slipcase and inside you get a coffee table book all about George Zell and then it goes through all the recordings. Somebody here at Sony obviously loved George Zell. This is obviously a labor of love and we have 106 CDs all reproduced with the original covers and the original lighter notes in the back, which you can't read because the print is too small. I don't care. But there's some classic stuff in here that is just so good. The Beethoven Symphony Cycle, the Dvorak, the Brahms, the Schumann 1 and 4. There's just too much here for you to go through almost. And it's going to take you, you know, take, keep you busy for the next several months. And the best part of this, I got this entire set, the slipcase, the coffee table book, and the 106 CDs. It was on sale on Amazon for $109 shipped new. So when I did my other audio room tour, some of you wrote in and said, come on, Ed, we know you have more than one audio system, don't you? You're just that kind of guy. And of course, they're right. I do have more than one audio system. Normally this happens when I change or upgrade one component to uh, the main system and eventually I have enough parts left over to assemble another system. So we're here down in the basement and this back wall was blank. So I figured I had enough components and we could just set this up. Speakers here are Martin Logan Arius. These are a classic electrostatic loudspeaker from the 1990s. If you know your audiophile speakers, you probably know this model. Are these still competitive today? Yes, they are. I've been listening to these. There is nothing wrong with these. In fact, they are still quite good. They sometimes are described as having a see-through sound or a hear-through sound because it's just a piece of Mylar film. These have a very clean, fast sound. And if you think it's unusual to be listening to a 30-year-old set of speakers, keep in mind that there are still very serious audiophiles listening to their quad ESL57s and ESL63s. And if you don't know, the last two numbers are the digits of the year in which they came out. 
Amplifier here is a Parasound HCA800-2. It is classified as a power amplifier, but there are gain controls for both channels on the front, so it actually can function as an integrated amplifier with one input, and in fact that's how I'm using it right now with the Parasound CDP-1000 that's been a very reliable CD player. So one quirk about electrostatic loudspeakers is that they do need to be plugged in. So despite the fact that this is a relatively simple system, there's a lot of power cords going on here. So I have this monster power conditioner which has 10 power outlets in the back, and so it winds up helping a lot with the cable management. And here is another system that I have. This one is a nostalgia system from 1977. This is the receiver I wanted, and I've wanted it ever since I saw it on the cover of the 1977 Radio Shack catalog, endorsed by Arthur Fiedler himself. 16 watts per channel, $239 at the time. Now, finding these old receivers is a challenge these days because they have cosmetic damage, they have electronics damage at this point. What happens internally is that the capacitors dry out, these lamps up here that you see, you can just barely see this is illuminated. Those burn out and the contacts get scratchy and you have to deoxid those things. There's a local rebuilder who refurbishes these things and he sold me this receiver for next to nothing. I couldn't believe how cheap this was. So I got this and once I had the heart of the system, the rest of it wasn't too bad. The turntable is a realistic Lab 290. Not quite from the same period, it's a few years later, but it's pretty close and it'll do for now. I got this for free at the town swap shed at the transfer station. We have a little shed where we trade things for free. I didn't even think it was going to work when I brought it home. Belt drive semi-automatic, queued it up, everything works. It's perfect. The only thing I had a concern about was the cartridge and the stylus. I wasn't quite sure about the status of those. So I did what a lot of people do. I put an Audio-Technica AT3600 on it. That is a Budget King favorite cartridge. You can get them for less than $20. The speakers are Minimus 2.5s. Oh yes, wonderful. A full range three inch driver and it's rated for 10 watts. I'm not sure I would put anywhere near that kind of power through these. So again, it's a nostalgia system. I don't care how it sounds. It just brings me back to an earlier time when things weren't quite so complicated. And I try to play music from the period. So we have some records here. The Association, greatest hits. Oh yeah, Sunshine Band, like that. George Winston's Autumn, I think this is still the best album that he ever put out. Oh, Andy Gibb. You know, when I first fo started following the Top 40 with Casey Kasem on Saturday mornings, when I first started listening to him, I Just Want to Be Your Everything was the number one song, and I would sit there by the radio and try to study, hmm, why is this so good? Why is it so popular? Chuck Mangione. For a few months in the late 1970s, everybody knew what a flugelhorn was. Bruce Springsteen, Darkness on the Edge of Town. This is a masterpiece. I also like this one very much. Jackson Brown, Running on Empty. Talks about what life on the road is like. Makes it feel very lonely. And my favorite movie of all time when I was a kid was Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. When my parents would drive me places, you know, to the mall or to the grocery store, I used to pretend that the car could fly. So again, nostalgia system, I don't really care how it sounds. If you need to know what kind of interconnects and speaker cables I used, we need to have a talk. There you have it, folks, a look at the updated audio room. You know, I think I'm going to keep these speakers here, even if the cat wasn't coming back, which he is in a couple of months. He's going to stay with me for about a month. I'm really liking these. These are very musical, they're non-fatiguing, and the acid test for speakers, does it make you want to listen to them? These do. So even when he does come back, that cat, he likes music. If I play anything here, he comes running. And we have this ritual late at night where around 11 o'clock or so, just before bedtime, he likes to listen to one side of an LP. Not two, but, but one side, and, and we do that. And for some reason, he also really likes the Carpenters. If, if I play Karen Carpenter's voice, he'll come running and sit there and listen to it. So there you have it again. I hope you found this interesting and informative. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.